والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم مثل الذين ينفقون اموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبه انبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون ويخلق ما لا تعلمون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Peace and Allah's mercy be upon you Welcome to Universal Quran Alhamdulillah والسلام والسلام على رسول الله all praise belongs to Allah alone. We ask for His blessings and peace upon His Messenger and Prophet Muhammad. We're currently on the 29th section of the Holy Quran, which is called Juz Tabarak. Uh, and today we're reading from chapter 73, Al Muzammil. The Quran is a universal revelation for all of humanity. In a previous episode, we started from this surah. Uh, reading and discussing the meaning of this surah and how this chapter uh, commands the performance of prayer, especially the prayer at night and the recitation of the Holy Quran in a beautiful, slow recitation so that its meaning can be contemplated and understood. In the early stage in Mecca, the Muslims were few and they were persecuted and they were uh, they had to practice their religion basically in private. When the Prophet ﷺ would come out and pray in front of the Kaaba, in front of Allah's house that was built, the first place of worship built by Abraham, he would be harassed and even physically attacked. People would throw uh, garbage on him. Uh, people threatened to step on his neck during the performance of his prayers. And so the Muslims had to and normally did pray in private in their houses. And so the early days the prayer which was obligatory was the nighttime prayer, not the five daily prayers that were in the later stage in Mecca were revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an tells us how to recite the Qur'an in worship, what is the proper way of reciting it, and what the purpose of reciting it is. That by reciting it with tartil in a beautiful, slow, deliberate way, we can contemplate its meaning and the purpose of reciting it then is not simply a mindless ritual, but so that we can think of its meaning and be inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to obey the Qur'an. And that is the meaning of verse 5 that we uh, recited uh, in our last episode, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that He will send down a weighty revelation to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And being weighty means that the Qur'an has to be, we have to contemplate it, Think of its meaning, study its meaning, and then we have to live it. As the Prophet ﷺ did, as Aisha said, that his, his behavior, his character was the Qur'an. That he was a model in his daily conduct of the Qur'an. So the weighty aspect of the Qur'an is actually applying it. Many people listen to it, many people read it or recite it, but few people are able to perfectly uh, 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 follow it and be examples of its meaning in their lives. Also, Physically, the revelation of the Qur'an was a heavy burden for the Prophet himself. As we discussed, his countenance would change and become serious. He would be weighed down by the physical weight of it. He described that sometimes it would reverberate, almost as if a gong or a bell was ringing. And he would feel, and it would be very difficult for him to uh, uh, receive the Qur'an in that way. At other times, the angel would appear to him in the form of a man, and that was the easier way of receiving Allah's revelations uh, from from Him, we're going to go on. Last last episode, we were not able to read all the verses. We'll go from uh, verse six through nine. We have uh, uh, Sheikh Adil, who is an excellent example of tartil of the Quran, how to re re read it correctly in the Arabic language. And we have our brother Tahseen, who will uh, do a good job also reading for us the English interpretation of the Holy Quran. Yes, brother. إنا سنلقي عليك قولا ثقيلا 
إن ناشئة الليل هي أشد وطأا وأقوى مقيلا إن لك في النهار سبحا طويلا واذكر اسم ربك وتبتل إليه تبتيلا رب المشرق والمغرب لا إله إلا هو فاتخذه وكيلا Thank you. Verily, we shall send down to you a weighty word. Verily, the rising by night is very difficult and most potent and good for governing the soul and most suitable for understanding the word of Allah. Verily, there is for you by day prolonged occupation with ordinary duties. And remember the name of your Lord and devote yourself to him with complete devotion. He alone is the Lord of the East and the West. None has the right to be worshipped but he. So take him alone as disposer of your affairs. Thank you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the time of night, even though it's difficult for people to give up their sleep and people feel lazy and they feel tired, but to get up and uh, perform your purification, your wudu with water, uh, will increase your 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 uh, strength and ability and it's the best time to think and contemplate the most appropriate time to think and contemplate the meaning of the Quran at that time you're not busy it's quiet the world is quiet most of the people are sleeping and the people of strong faith are in their homes quietly praying and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that in the day in verse 7 in the day you have prolonged occupation with your ordinary duties of the day keeping you busy with making your living or with teaching other people, making da'wah, or uh, in the case of the Prophet وسلم, having to advise people who are always coming to him with their problems and their questions, and speaking to his people and preaching. And in all aspects, it keeps one very busy in the day. You don't have time to concentrate sometimes on the meaning of the Qur'an. For that reason, you see, for example, that in our five daily prayers, that the times when you recite aloud the Qur'an are in the early morning at Fajr prayer and in the evening prayers in Maghrib and Isha as well as in the Tuhajjud prayer at, at night time, late at night, which is a, not a non-obligatory prayer. But in the daytime when people are busy, the Qur'an recitation is silent, it's quiet. Uh, and, uh, but in the nighttime, people are rested from their work, they're, 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 they're not busy, and they can listen carefully to the recitation and get the most out of it. So these verses made the night prayer, the late night prayer to be obligatory originally. Uh, according to Aisha, uh, in the hadith found in Sahih Muslim, that was the original case. And then within a year or so, the last part of this chapter was revealed that uh, revokes that obligation. And it was no longer a duty upon them. They would pray so long their feet would swell up. It was so difficult for them to do. So Allah made it an option for them to pray as much as they could in the night whenever they were able to. But it became an option. It was no longer a duty or obligation for the Muslims. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't give up, but he continually prayed the night prayer. As long as he was alive, he didn't give up praying that prayer. Also, Aisha describes the prayer of the Prophet ﷺ, the, the prayer of Witr or Tahajjud, the late night uh, prayer, that he would pray 11 rakahs or 11 units of prayer. Later on in his life, he would reduce that to nine when it got to be too difficult for him and his, uh, he was weaker as an older person and he would pray nine. But he never increased, he never prayed more than 11 units of prayer in Ramadan or any time. So it's not part of the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam to pray more than 11 units of prayer at night. But it, the sunnah is to pray 11 or less but an odd number of rakahs or units of prayer. Uh, in verse 8, uh, and remember the name of your Lord, that the purpose of prayer is to be reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of His names and His attributes. All the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, are examples of His perfection and His superiority over any of the creation and that He alone deserves our worship and glory. And so we should be devoted to Him with complete devotion, a tabatul. And a tabatul in Arabic implies like, for example, the monks used to live not marrying, uh, not having any worldly occupation, just worshipping day and night, day and night. And so 
of course, Islam condemned that kind of excess in religion. So Muslims are supposed to get married. They're supposed to have a job like other people, a normal living, enjoy themselves, their family, and their children, but spend time in worship. And one of the times when you can be in that way is at night, when you don't have any other worries and occupations and busyness. So, uh, for example, in the early days when the Roman Empire was fighting against the Muslims, and the Muslims came to Jerusalem, and by Allah's grace, they were able to uh, occupy and free the, the city of Jerusalem, the third holiest city in Islam. Some people went and told the emperor that uh, we can't fight these people. In the day, they're warriors. At the night, they're monks. Because their whole night isn't spent uh, drinking and partying like the, 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 the Christian warriors, but their night was spent, uh, or, or just sleeping like, like ordinary people do, but their night was spent in worship and devotion to their Lord. So to devote as much time in sincerity, ikhlas, to batul, to Allah SWT, which means that if you're totally devoted to, to, to something or anything, when you're devoted to something, it means nothing else distracts you. So nothing else should be sharing in any of your worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the true meaning of tawheed or the oneness of Allah that nothing else shares with His devotion with, in your heart. But it's totally devoted to Allah alone. He is, verse 9, He alone is the Lord of the East and the West. None has the right to be worshipped but He. So take Him alone as the disposer, wakil of your affairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the sun and caused it to rise in the east and set in the west. Of course, we know by the rotation of the earth. Uh, Allah alone is the one who has the power to create day and night upon which all of us depend for our affairs, our daily affairs, everything, our rest at night, the division of our day into a time of activity, a time of rest is a fundamental part of our human psychology. So we, we can tell by um, experiments today, for example, that people who are deprived of knowledge of the alternation of day and night lose track of the 24-hour period. And so they, if, if you leave them alone in a dark place where they can't tell the difference between night, the day and night, there's artificial light sources. Within uh, a few months, they will have lost uh, many days out of their schedule. They will think that the day is actually much longer than it is. So their bodies, their health will suffer. They won't get as much rest as they're supposed to. So humans depend on those things. The, the alternation of the day and night, uh, sun rising in the east and setting in the west. And so Allah SWT is the one who has ordered our affairs. So we should entrust Him with our affairs. Trusting in Allah SWT Giving Him our trust means that we work to achieve whatever our goals are that are permitted in Islam. But we know that the outcome is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't give up hope if sometimes we're not successful in achieving some aspects of this life of this world. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us in these verses to understanding not only to believe in the Qur'an, but to follow it and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and devote ourselves to Him in worship alone. Jazakum Allahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Earth, the human heart, greed, exploitation, hatred, all diseases of the heart. For the cure, join Huda TV every Sunday at 20 GMT for Moments for the Heart. Welcome back to Universal Qur'an. We are reading from chapter 73, Al-Muzammil. In the previous verses, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had commanded the prayer at night in the early days of the revelation of the Qur'an in Mecca, which was later uh, transferred to praying the five daily prayers in the day and night. 
And this late night prayer became an optional practice, but it's a highly recommended practice of Islam. A good time to recite the Quran and listen to its recitation and contemplate its meaning. And that we may devote ourselves and worship exclusively to the Creator and Sustainer, not to any other being, but devote our prayers and all acts of worship to Him alone and allow Him to be the disposer of our affairs or wakil, which means that we will allow Him to decide the final outcome of any event. This does not mean, as it's called tawakkul in Islamic terminology, this does not mean that we don't try to do the causes of achieving our goals, but we want a miracle to happen. But we trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the birds who trust in Allah. They go out in the day searching for food and they come back at night full. And just like them, we go out in the day, we go search for our, our, our provision from Allah, we work and achieve whatever we can achieve. But we trust that Allah will help us and give us the strength necessary. We don't have any strength except from the strength that is given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if sometimes we try to do something good, but we're not able to achieve it, but the intention was there, that itself is a good deed and an act of worship uh, by even having the intention to do something good. So when we go out and try to support our families in what is permitted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is an act of worship in Islam. Even if we're not as successful as we had planned, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us uh, and give us the provision which He has decreed for all of His uh, servants. We're now going to go on and read uh, uh, verses 10 through 14, please. وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا يَقُولُونَ وَاهْجُرْهُمْ هَجْرًا جَمِيلًا وَذَرْنِي وَالْمُكَذِّبِينَ أُولِي النَّعْمَةِ وَمَهِّلْهُمْ قَلِيلًا إن لدينا أنكالا وجحيما وطعاما ذا غصة وعذابا أليما يوم ترجف الأرض والجبال وكانت الجبال كثيبا مهيلا Thank you. Beautiful. Absolutely. And be patient with what they say. And keep away from them in a good way. And leave me alone to deal with the beliers and those who are in possession of good things of life and give them respite for a little while. Verily with us are fetters to bind them in a raging fire and a food and a food that chokes and a painful torment on the day when the earth and mountains will be in violent shake and the mountains will heap of sand poured out and flowing down. Thank you, brother. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed these verses in the early days of Makkah, as I have said before, and is advising the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims at that time, and at any time of difficulty and persecution and trouble for Muslims anywhere in the world, to be patient and endure what people say. When people ridicule you, don't allow them to draw you into also ridiculing them. And if they say evil words to you, don't repeat evil words to them, but re reply to evil with good by saying good words to them and praying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would guide them. And so Muslims have been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to present a good image of Islam by good behavior as the Prophet himself, uh, may Allah's blessing and peace be upon him, did. And when they, for example, they would curse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not allowed in return to re curse their idols. Because if we, if we curse their idols, then they will curse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reply. So you have to ignore the evil things that are said by people out of their ignorance and stupidity and hatred of things which they don't understand because they don't understand the truth. But they are unfortunately uh, stuck in false concepts and uh, uh, customs which they have learned from their society and they have not thought carefully about the consequences of their deeds and actions. So what do we do when our friends or our neighbors or people we work with or people we know uh, are evil behavior and evil words and deeds and they treat us in that way or they despise Islam or ridicule Islam or ridicule the Prophet Sallallahu or his companions or the Quran? What do we do? Sometimes even Muslims today 
are so ignorant of Islam that they act that way. So they see a Muslim who is following his or her religion, uh, and they ridicule them, ridicule the religion of Islam, and say things to them to try to get them angry. We're not supposed to start yelling and screaming at them, cursing at them, and replying in, with negative behavior. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to make hijra from them, uh, to keep away from them in a good way, uh, in a beautiful way. Hijran jamila. And this means that you avoid those people who want conflict, who do not want to dialogue with you or debate with you. Uh, if you can avoid them, uh, because of that reason, then even if they're Muslims, you're allowed to avoid them. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that a Muslim is not allowed to stay away and avoid his brother Muslim. But that is, of course, a Muslim who is behaving by the correct Islamic behavior. So, for example, I have a dispute with you and a disagreement with you. I'm not allowed to be angry and avoid you. But I have to come to you. In fact, the one who begins by saying salam, peace to his brother, it has a greater reward. But we have to go back and reconcile, even if we have a dispute. But say there's a Muslim person, a so-called Muslim, who uh, treats you in an evil way, with very bad behavior, obnoxious behavior, evil language, cursing Islam, not following Islam. You try talking to that person, and yet it doesn't do any good. They don't want to talk. They are not reasonable. Then you are allowed in Islam to avoid that person, and the Muslim community is allowed to cut off themselves from that person. But not by cursing the person, spreading gossip about him uh, or, or speaking evil, but in a beautiful way, meaning by Islamic etiquette. You avoid that person. Or if you cannot physically avoid them, you, you smile in their face, uh, say salam to them and whatever, but you avoid talking to them as much as you can or arguing or debating when it becomes clear to you that that is useless. And if in the future that person changes his or her behavior, uh, you or other Muslims can try to resume dialogue with that person about their misconceptions or evil practices. And this is the counsel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for any Muslim in difficult circumstances with people who do not follow Islam correctly. And Allah says, leave me alone with those people who deny. And he's speaking about those people who deny this message of the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam in that generation and in any generation, not necessarily a specific person, but any of the different leaders of that time of the Quraysh, the leaders of the city of Mecca. And you can tell who they are because Allah said, the ones who possess the good things of this life, those who are wealthy and powerful in the society, who have the respect, who are the leaders of the society. The Prophet in Dawah tried to spend, send his message to those people because they were influential in society, but sometimes they were it was worthless even trying to talk to them because they would just ridicule Islam. So Allah said, I am able to grant them punishment immediately. Allah is able to punish them immediately, cause their death, cause destruction upon them, but He is granting them a respite. He is granting them a period of time. Either in that period of time they will be guided by Allah and repent and become Muslims, or they will continue being more and more evil so that they will deserve the maximum punishment in the hereafter. So Allah has uh, waited until their fate is sealed one way or the other and then He will punish them either in this life or in the hereafter. What do we have to look forward to in the hereafter if we reject this message? Fetters uh, uh, and a raging fire. Allah SWT is saying they're going to be bound just as their wealth and power gives them great freedom in this life and great power. They'll be powerless. Not only will, will they be in hellfire, but they will be bound. They will not be able to move. They will not be able to move from one place to the other. They will have no volition or choice over any matter. So the most powerful people in this world, uh, when they become arrogant, are not able to submit themselves to Allah, not able to humble themselves before Allah. So in the hereafter, they will be humbled and they will be totally submitted. They will not even be able to choose where they go or what they do. Uh, the food has been described in this verse as food that chokes, that cannot be swallowed. It's been described in other verses as food, for example, like thorns uh, or, or the terrible discharges of, of the bodies of the people of hellfire, that all that is, 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 is disgusting and is of no value. It does not provide them any nutrition. It does not provide them any growth or increase in strength or rest. 
nor does it satisfy them, make them feel better uh, psychologically after you eat a delicious meal. You feel really good, even if you weren't that hungry before, but you enjoy it because of the taste and enjoyment. So there's neither enjoyment and taste, nor is there nutrition and benefit from eating the food of hellfire. And in fact, as this, it chokes you, you can't eat it, eat it at all. It's, a, it's totally worthless. On the day, on verse 14, the earth and the mountains will shake violently and the mountains will become a heap of sand poured out or flowing down. On that day, the earth will be destroyed. It will be totally changed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The earth will quake in violent quakes. The, the earth, we've never seen anything like it in the past and nobody has ever experienced something, something that would be totally destructive. So much of the mountains are shaken and turn into sand. They lose all their ability at all. In the past, there have been great earthquakes. Uh, mountains have been destroyed. But it's nothing compared to what will be seen uh, at the end of this world. And so Allah is telling us that, yes, you have experienced something, but just like the description of heaven and hell, Jannah and Nar, are only clues to the reality which is far beyond any garden or any fire in this world, so these earthquakes at the end of times will be something to totally destroy the world. The world will be totally flattened. The mountains will be, will be flattened. The world will be one giant plain so that all of mankind can be gathered together in one flat place before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But seeing these sights are a great warning to us of the coming of the Day of Judgment. We can read verses 15 through <coughs> Uh, 17, please. Inna arsalna ilaykum rasoolan shahidan alaykum kama arsalna ila fir'awna rasoola fa'asa fir'awna rasoola fa'akhaznahu akhzan wabila فَكَيْفَ تَتَّقُونَ إِن كَفَرْتُمْ يَوْمًا يَجْعَلُ الْوِلْدَانَ شِيبًا السَّمَاءُ مُنْفَطِرٌ بِهِ كَانَ وَعْدُهُ مَفْعُولًا إِنَّ هَذِهِ تَذْكِرَةٌ فَمَنْ شَاءَ اتَّخَذَ إِلَى رَبِّهِ سَبِيلًا Verily, we have sent to you a messenger to be a witness over you, as we did send a messenger to Pharaoh. But Pharaoh disobeyed the messenger Moses, so we seized him with a severe punishment. Then how can you avoid the punishment if you disbelieve on a day that will make children gray-headed? Whereon the heaven will be cliffed asunder, his promise is certainly to be accomplished. Verily, this is a Ad, ad, uh, admonition therefore whoever so whoever so uh, whosoever will let him take a path to his lord thank you so these verses 15 through 19 are continuing after Allah SWT has given us example of the destruction of at the end of this world of the mountains and the violent earthquakes um, we will continue with this uh, next Next uh, episode, unfortunately, we're not able to continue with the tafsir today. So please join us next time. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلكية